Hello, welcome to the Friday, July 21st, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Now, what better way to start a Friday podcast than a little bit of crypto? And what we got today is how to check whether or not a private key actually matches a given public key for an RSA key, like of course we often have with SSL certificates. For SSL, we do have our public key, which is usually included in the certificate. And then we have a private key that, of course, we should keep private. Now, the private key file actually includes the public key in addition to the private key and additional information. Now, the reason it's important is that certificate authorities, and in this case, Symantec, have become more proactive in revoking certificates if the private key leaked. Now, this is a good thing because once the private key leaked, I can just get the certificate from the website and impersonate that website. Or worse, if the ciphers aren't configured quite well, I can even decrypt content I recorded from that site. So once Symantec finds a private key out in the wild, they of course have to verify whether it matches a given certificate. And apparently the only thing they do here is they check whether the public key that's included in that private key file matches the public key included in their certificate. They don't actually check the private key for consistency, whether or not the private and public part match. Now, as you can imagine, it's pretty easy to get the public key I get it from the certificate and then I can create an artificial private key file that's of course invalid but contains the public key from a known website. So an hacker could create such a file, drop it on a site like Pastebin, wait for Symantec to find it and have Symantec revoke the certificate for the given website, which of course would then amount to a denial of service against this website. Pretty tricky attack and it's a little bit helped by an oddity in OpenSSL. OpenSSL has a function called check private key, but really all it does is it checks whether or not the public part of the private key file matches the public key. So it does exactly this sloppy checking that sort of got Symantec into trouble here. OpenSL doesn't really consider this a vulnerability because the documentation for this function does describe it does just this. There are other features in OpenSL that can be used to check the private key file for consistency. And that's really what you have to do first before you just rely on that public key comparison. It is not clear whether Symantec did fix its process to address this issue. And it's of course also possible that other certificate authorities have similar problems given that OpenSL, a very popular library that of course is often used to automate these processes does have this oddly named function. From a defensive point, not much really you can do about it other than watch out for any emails you get from your certificate authorities uh, because they may alert you that they are about to revoke your certificate. So then at least you can step in and maybe prevent a revocation or issue a new certificate. And then we got an interesting bug in GNOME files. Now, GNOME files creates thumbnails of files in order to display them to the user when you're looking at the directory listing. And apparently how these thumbnails are created is a little bit shady. If you do have Wine, the Windows emulator installed on Linux, what happens here is if you have an MSI file, that part of the file name may actually be executed as a script. So whenever you're using GNOME files to look at a directory that contains an MSI file, a DLL file, or a shortcut, a link file, then this thumbnailer is called and it will eventually execute script if the file name contains script. So the file name has to contain the script, not the file itself. 
This has been fixed now and a patch has been released. Essentially, the root cause here was that they sort of blindly called the MSI file parser without actually properly realizing what that parser does when it's loaded in Wine. So it's Friday again and uh, with me today I got uh, Colm Kennedy, uh, he's one of our STI graduate students, just finished or about to finish his certificate here. Uh, Colm, uh, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Hi, uh, Johannes. My name is Colm Kennedy. Uh, I'm an information security manager at private equity firm Bain Capital based in Boston. Uh, among my many responsibilities, I am responsible for a vulnerability management program here, and I'm honored to be on the call today. Yeah, uh, thanks. And, and now you wrote a pretty interesting uh, paper here as part of your research work, and it was really about you know, using PowerShell to sort of supplement your vulnerability scanning program. Now, typically you use more of these large commercial packages for vulnerability scans. What was sort of the gap that PowerShell here uh, filled for you? Um, it, was, it was more of a time management gap. I found myself a lot of times chasing down false positives and in, in a larger capacity looking at 30, 40 servers that showed missing three-year-old vulnerabilities, um, I, I decided to kind of come up with a script to kind of give me a quick overview in a table format to eye over quickly and, and see whether it was a false positive or if need further investigation. Now PowerShell really has sort of become that uh, Swiss army knife uh, for security professionals on the defensive and offensive side. Uh, your use was more defensive. Uh, what did you find sort of particularly useful and easy to do when you use PowerShell versus you know, using some other language? I had never used PowerShell prior to uh, attempting this research. So how easy it was to you know make in my script to make a remote registry connection and, and a, a remote PowerShell connection and also like automating the WMI calls and, and stuff like that. And it really just made it very simple to, to accomplish what I was looking to do. Now one tricky part of course with these uh, remote sessions is always uh, how do you authenticate? Uh, any tricks are sort of used here or how did you sort of store credentials in order uh, to keep things somewhat secure? Yeah, so I, I basically was opening uh, PowerShell ISE um, as my elevated credentials I have at my company that only has permissions to certain systems and, and no remote capabilities. So that way, when I ran any script, it was running as that uh, system administrator account. So uh, that way you didn't actually have to expose any credentials in configuration files or the like? Or no, no. And, and, and a big part of the script that uh, I had written, um, I wanted to make sure that it was easily transferable to others so my credentials weren't in there or, or my, my name wasn't in there. It just could kind of be configurable to other environments as well. That's pretty neat. Uh, did you publish uh, that script? I have not yet. I'm, I'm going to. Um, I, I wanted to make one or two small adjustments just to make sure that uh, it was working 100% in other environments as well as my own. Yeah, now uh, with uh, PowerShell, of course, uh, you can also uh, query a lot of configuration parameters and uh, issues like that. Uh, any plans uh, to expand uh, the script to this or what is it actually sort of collecting right now? Um, so what, what it collects is it, is it makes calls out to a, a list of systems that um, are fed into the PowerShell script. It basically is returning to me the operating system of the system, the number of missing patches, uh, the last boot time of that system, which is another indicator of you know when the system was last patched and then also the five specific applications that I was looking for the versions of uh, Chrome, Firefox, Java, Adobe Reader and Adobe Flash that came across as versions weren't kept kept date so it kind of gave me all the information I needed and, and returned it in a table where I could see the different versions and what was out of date and what, what I needed to kind of touch on manually. So a lot of this would apply to workstations as well as servers. It's nothing really sort of server specific or so that the, the script necessarily looks for. No, my, my use case was for servers, um, but it, I, I tested it against uh, workstations as well to make sure that it worked on them as well. So any other ideas where to take it from here? You mentioned that you want to make some more changes to the script. Uh, can you talk a little bit about sort of what the direction you would like to take this in? Within the script, I'm actually looking at 32-bit um, programs installed. And I have a line that's uh, commented out that looks for 64-bit programs. And within that, I kind of wanted to make sure that I could do both without having to comment one out or the other. Um, but being 
an extremely newbie to uh, PowerShell. I wasn't able to figure that out uh, in time to, to make that work uh, efficiently. Now, you mentioned uh, this was uh, the first uh, script that you wrote in uh, PowerShell. Uh, any hints as to how long it took you to get started, uh, to get up the level you're at now? Uh, what's the learning curve like with PowerShell? Um, it, it really came down to like searches online. Um, it took me about two months to kind of get to a point where I could write this script. And, and you know, like any scripts, you're kind of copy and pasting from different ideas from different scripts you find online and making it work in the, in the way that you need it to work. And, and I think it took about two, two and a half months for me to get to a point where I felt comfortable in, in creating this script in particular. It's not really all that uh, bad. So anything next for you after finishing your graduate certificate now? So I'm going to continue learning uh, and take advantage of what PowerShell has to offer. I'm going to start working on my CSSP certification, which I kind of put on hold while I completed the uh, certification program. Uh, thanks again for joining me here uh, today. That's it for today. Thanks, everybody, for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.